Hello class, my name is Lance Vogt and I am the instructor of this course, Principles of Microeconomics. It's a pleasure to uh, be your instructor this term. Today's lecture is going to be an introduction to economics in general. Uh, this would be the same lecture you would get in a Principles of Microeconomics course or a Principles of Macroeconomics course. And I believe it does a good job of kind of helping you understand what economics is how economists think, and kind of sets the stage for what lies ahead in the course. To give you a little roadmap of today's lecture, uh, I have put together this slide to kind of show you the main topics that we'll discuss within this lecture. So if you're going through uh, and studying for the course, or you are going through the lecture and trying to kind of see what are the main topics that you need to uh, take away from this, as you take your my econ lab courses uh, or your quizzes or homework assignments or you're participating in discussion boards for the course and or doing any supplemental assignments or homework uh, this can hopefully kind of get you to where you need to go a little bit more efficiently this lecture will talk about scarcity economics decision making efficiency positive and normative economics, the difference between the two, economic models, questions about allocation of resources, and then lastly, we'll finish the lecture by talking about the legal framework of market economies. I like to preface this course by talking about Mick Jagger. So Mick Jagger was the singer of the Rolling Stones, uh, and I like to bring up this question about whether or not he's an economist. Uh, Mick Jagger, believe it or not, went to the London School of Economics. But the reason why I bring this up is one of my favorite TV shows growing up in the 2000s was House MD. Hugh Laurie played Dr. Gregory House. And in the pilot episode, he talked to his boss, Dr. Cuddy, who was requesting him to complete his clinic hours. She was in charge of the clinic and she was in charge of the teaching hospital that he was working at. And House replied to that request, as the philosopher Jagger once said, you can't always get what you want, which is referring to a song by the Rolling Stones by the same title. And really, this is what the crux of economics is. This is the reason why I preface this course by saying, is Mick Jagger really an economist? Uh, well, he studied some economics in, in London growing up. But really, what I wanted to point out and highlight here is that economics is going to be rooted from this concept of scarcity. And scarcity is the situation where unlimited wants exceed the limited resources available to fulfill those wants. Everybody wants everything. There are a lot of things that we want, but we're limited by some sort of lack of resource. Most of the time it's money. So a lot of times it could be natural resources. Maybe you don't have enough space. But in reality is, even if we had all of those things, we're still limited by time. And the real takeaway from scarcity is that we can't always get what we want. And the reality is, is that we have to make choices as a result. And as we'll learn, economics arises from scarcity because we have to make choices. And that really is what economics is. When you walked into this course, well, you didn't really walk into it. You logged into this course. When you logged into this course, you might have thought about uh, economics is about money. And in fact, if you take a macroeconomics course, there's an entire lecture about money. But, and a lot of textbooks might have a dollar bill on the cover. But the reality is, is that it's more broad than that. And economics really is just a thought process. It's a tool set and it's a social science. What is a social science? It's an academic discipline that utilizes data rather than randomized controlled experiments like you would see in, say, a bio class or a chemistry lab. And the goal is to kind of fulfill the demands of the scientific method. We ask questions, we pose hypotheses, we want to try to solve problems and answer questions. That's really what social science is as it relates to people and the economy. But economics is not just about money and analyzing decisions related to money. Money is an efficient means of transactional uh, 
situation, so we like to use that as a quantifier in a lot of our data because it's easier, but it doesn't have to be that way. Really, economics is more broad, and it's just a social science that encompasses that scientific method, thought process, and problem-solving process to analyze and describe the consequences of the choices that we make as a result of having those scarce resources. So that's a, it's a mouthful of a definition, but in reality, that's all it comes down to. You can study whatever you want in this course. Uh, unfortunately, in the principles courses, we're kind of set to a set curriculum for the most part in terms of truly understanding markets in this course and optimization in a microeconomics course as you will learn as we move forward. But in a macroeconomics course, uh, it's completely different. It's about studying the economy as a whole and well-being and kind of discussing policies as pertain to that. However, economics can be about anything. It can be about sports. It can be about labor. It can be about crime. It can be about the environment. Uh, it could be specific to macro or micro. It could be data science related. It can really be, you can really study whatever you want. You're going to get a broad set of skills if you end up uh, pursuing economics beyond the uh, general education curriculum. You'll get some data skills. You'll learn about some different topics as they pertain to it, but you'll really be just analyzing scarcity or choices that are arising based on decision making that has to happen. And, ha and what is the optimal situation there? Is what's happening correct? Is what's happening wrong? Is there a law that needs to be implemented that can provide something? Is there an incentive that can be provi provided to help uh, solve a problem? It can really be about whatever you want. Uh, when I was a student, I studied interest rates and whether or not they were changing as a result of monetary policy. Not the most exciting thing in the world, but particularly important at the time in which it was implemented during the Great Recession. Uh, in my master's program, I studied whether or not students attended a specific university based on whether or not uh, they had certain characteristics on their application, whether or not whether they were from a specific town or how far they would had a positive or negative relationship on their likelihood of attending. And then when I was studying at the University of Oregon, I did a project on uh, the economic impact of wildfires in national parks and their gateway communities. So those are all completely unrelated, but use similar skill sets. And that's kind of what you can get from taking an economics course. As I mentioned before, choices, decision making is really the root of economics. Uh, when we get into the course, you might not necessarily see that to be true, but if you kind of keep this in the back of your mind, you'll understand that truly this is really what economics boils down to. It's really just a tool set. Now we can apply it to different things, but the core theory is still decision making related at, it, at, its, at, its, at its basis. So in terms of decision making, um, economists talk about these three decision making principles that can help guide individuals, countries, firms to really getting to kind of what is the optimizing behavior? What is the best thing? What is the best outcome for me based on the choices that I can make? And really an efficient or an optimal decision maker considers these three characteristics. The first one is considered rationality. It's people weighing the benefits and costs of their actions. The second one is people respond to strong economic incentives. And lastly, decisions of how much of an activity to partake in are made using marginal analysis. It's not enough to just say yes or no, I'm going to do something. Sometimes to figure out what the best option is, is to kind of continue duct this marginal analysis, which we'll spend almost the entire course talking about. So the first principle, the first decision making concept I want to talk about is this concept of rationality. I don't really mention it in the slide, but if you read it through the textbook or you look online at alternative sources, you might hear about this as being quote unquote rational. Now this doesn't mean that 
individuals are going to weigh benefits and costs the same way that society would. So the person that cuts me off on the highway when there's snow on the ground going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, you might think that they're not rational for doing that because they're saving, what, 20 seconds on their commute. But to them, the benefit outweighed the cost based on their own individual decision-making process. So the other thing that we need to think about in relationship to this is that costs don't just mean how much I spend on something. So let's say that you decide that you are a server at a restaurant and so if you call off work, you lose out on uh, wages and tips and maybe a promotion, a manager, or something like that. Those are known as opportunity costs. Let's say you're calling off work because you want to go to a concert. Well, there's an explicit cost of going to the concert. There's the gas to get there, the transportation, maybe you get some food or some drinks at the concert, maybe you buy some merchandise, maybe uh, you get a little bit of hearing damage from it. Whatever the reason, the those are explicit costs. But in order to truly understand the true cost of that concert, you not only need to factor in those costs, but the opportunity cost of the missed wages and the potential write-up or miss out on a promotion or tips that come from missing work. That's the total cost of the decision. Now that's not to say that you shouldn't go to the concert. It's just to say that you're rational because you have subjectively decided that the benefit of seeing your favorite artist or band in concert, hearing those songs live, potentially meeting them, spending time with family or friends or a significant other at that event outweighs in your own personal subjective mind the cost of skipping work. That's rationality. It's important to understand this as well as when we get to the second concept here, which is responding to economic incentives, that when policymakers are coming up with laws or allocations to figure out what is the best outcome to solve a problem that we see as a problem in society, we need to look at it from the perspective of the individual making the decision. There's a lot of times in which laws didn't work, particularly in the 80s and 90s when they were cracking down on crime, because of the fact the incentives that society was trying to avoid and prevent were not the same decision-making incentives or concerns that the individuals or groups that were the subject of the legislation or the inspiration for the legislation we're responding to. So this leads me into my second topic, which is economic incentives. People respond to strong economic incentives. People are more likely to engage in a certain activity if they have some sort of motivation to do so. Incentives are a catalyst. So you might be on the fence of whether or not you're going to engage in an activity but if there's some sort of sweetener to push you over the edge to do something, then you might do it. So case in point, when I was moving recently, a few months ago, I um, needed some help loading my moving van to move out here. And... My friends were kind of on the fence of doing it because they had other things they were going to go. They were going to go rafting down the Willamette River, which is wonderful. And I wish I was doing that instead of packing all my belongings. But you know what? Life happens. So in order to convince him, I gave him uh, an organizer for his bedroom from our belongings and I bought him lunch and that convinced him to help me move the stuff. So maybe he would have done it without me offering that. Maybe he wouldn't have. But because I offered those things for him, he decided to take it, help me, get his organizer, get his lunch. And then he went on his merry way floating down the Willamette River. 
Lucky for him. So incentives can not only be an encourager, but they can also be a discourager as well. So laws, in a way, are there to disincentivize behavior that society frowns upon or finds abhorrent. So, but incentives are really a big, big factor in terms of decision making. You need to look at it from the perspective of the individual making the decision and see what their incentives are versus what the incentives of someone else is that's making the decision in terms of the law to see if it's actually going to work. So let's consider the following scenarios to kind of play this out. So thousands of students enroll in medical school each year, but there is a significant shortage in general practice doctors. Why? So the reality is, is in areas all over the country, there's a huge distribution problem in terms of medical care. In urban settings, in rural settings, in terms of how many general practice doctors, primary care providers there are, nurse practitioners, nurses in general. So the question is, there's tons of there's enough people in medical school to fulfill all these problems, but why is there a shortage in certain regions or why is there a shortage overall in terms of general practice? And the reason for that is due to the fact that the incentive that's there is the average medical student takes out a quarter of a million dollars in student loan debt. So in order to pay that off, you need to make a lot of money. Now, the average general practice doctor makes $190,000 a year. I would take that salary in a heartbeat, especially since I have student loan debt that isn't quite a quarter of a million dollars, but would make your brain melt if you saw it, because it makes my brain melt every month that I make my student loan payment. But I made that choice, and I'm living with it. Realistically, though, if you compare that to specialists who on average make 300000 or more a year, if you're going to spend the same amount of time in school, why not specialize and make an extra $100,000 a year? And so 70% of all new doctors are specialists, 30% are general practice. In order to solve the problem, we kind of need to flip it. So in order to change that, we need to think about how do we provide incentives to flip that number? And so I would like for you in the discussion board to kind of discuss whether or not you have any ideas or you can comment on other classmates' ideas of how to kind of solve this issue. The second a scenario is related to the Department of Justice in the mid-2000s saying that there was a huge rise in the number of bank robberies in the uh, at banks. And so they, uh, the Department of Justice sent the memorandum out and said, hey, maybe you should install bulletproof glass or hire security guards to combat spikes in bank robberies. Most banks didn't do either of those things. Some of them installed more cameras, but a lot of them didn't do this. In fact, there's really only been one bank where I've seen bulletproof glass at the teller window, and I did not feel comfortable. So why is this the case? Why didn't they oblige? Well, I might have just mentioned one of them. If you go to your bank and it looks clear and comfortable and safe, and then the next week you come back and there's a big piece of glass indicating that you or someone else might be a threat that walks in there, you might not be as willing to attend or go to that bank. But the bigger reason really goes to kind of the economic cost associated with installing that glass or hiring the security guard versus the actual amount of economic loss or money lost from that robbery. The average bank robbery 
a bank robber gets away with fifteen hundred dollars. So bulletproof glass, more expensive. Security guard, more expensive. Most of the time, the bank robber gets caught. About 90% of the time, the bank robber gets caught. And so the question is, why are they robbing banks? When I was in law school, I had a criminal law professor who was actually a dis uh, defense Public defender, sorry. Public defender for, I think, seven years in California or Illinois. Sorry, I can't remember the specific state. But regardless, um, most bank robbers intend to get caught or know they're going to get caught. And they don't really care about the amount of money because you might be wondering, well, why would you rob a bank if it's only $1,500? A lot of the people that rob banks are recidivists. So recidivism is basically repeat offenses and violations of the law. So a lot of them are in and out of the system consistently. When they get out of the system, if they have a felony on their record, it's more difficult to get a job. There are some states that preclude felons from working in certain places, or they have a box that you have to check that uh, informs the, can the, the hiring committee that you are a convicted felon, and that uh, precludes a lot of candidates. So uh, a lot of them get sh struggle to make ends meet. Maybe they have family that they need to take care of. So they try to get a quick fix, whether it's for that. It could be diapers. It could be food. It could be whatever. A lot of times it's drug related. So a lot of individuals are um, committing these offenses to kind of meet a drug addiction that they're struggling with. And they're in out of the system. So you might wonder why. Why would you rob a bank if you're making so much money? And that's some anecdotal evidence uh, from an individual that was around a lot of bank robbers that he represented when he was working as a public defender. The last scenario I want to talk about relates to public school teachers in Chicago, Atlanta, and D.C. who in different cases were discovered aiding their students in cheating on standardized tests. So the question is why? What incentive is there to help your student cheat on their exam? Now I'll tell you the story about it. You can learn, you can look it up in the text or not textbook, the book Freakonomics. So Freakonomics is a book that I would recommend reading if you are interested in the material related to this course. And it really talks about incentives in detail. And really, uh, the reason why they did this was because of the way that their contracts were set up in terms of employment. You have standardized testing at certain benchmark grades in a lot of states. I'm not sure how it's done here. When I was growing up, I had standardized tests, I think, in like third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, seventh grade. And then there was a graduation test when I was in high school in 10th grade that I took. But in those years in which there isn't a standardized test at the end, you might not have to worry about passing your students through or making sure that they're up to the requisite level of learning because of the fact that there's no benchmark that you're being held accountable for. But if you're in those fifth grade, fourth grade, seventh grade benchmark teaching schemes, teaching grades, then what potentially happens is in a lot of those cities, what was happening was your employment was contingent upon successful pass rates or a certain percentage of your students passing the standardized test. Now, let's say that you're in, in Chicago or Atlanta or D.C. or any other city in the United States that has some sort of overcrowding, underfunding, uh segregation type issue with your educational system in that city and imagine that you're the fifth grade teacher you could be the best teacher of the ever the teacher of the year and you end up with students who are at a kindergarten reading level because they were not uh necessarily brought up to the level that they were supposed to without the benchmarking 
you're underfunded, you're overcrowded, and your textbooks are outdated, and you have to get in six to eight months these students up to a fifth grade reading level or competency in terms of whatever, you might resort, and your job's on the line, you might resort to extreme measures. This isn't to say it's correct behavior. This isn't to say that it's behavior that we are willing to accept. This is not to say that this behavior is something that we shouldn't correct as a society. But looking at it from the perspective of the individual's cost-benefit analysis and the incentives that they're undertaking, they would take their students' standardized test answers, change the answers that were provided by the student, and make sure that they did enough to pass. The interesting thing was the reason why they were caught was someone created an algorithm through a computer that kind of mapped out all the answers and the teacher was smart enough to not get all of the answers correct, but they were not, they didn't see the plan all the way through and they gave all of their students effectively the same answers. And so it was easy to catch it when they found the records. But I know this is a long time talking about incentives and scenarios, but I'm hoping to try and kind of get you to think about things a little bit differently. Look at it from the individual making the decision, look at it from the incentives that are provided and available to them, and know that kind of in terms of optimizing laws, decisions as a manager of a business, or as a entrepreneur, or as just, just deciding on what you're gonna eat for lunch, if you think about things from this perspective, it helps give you a little bit more insight as to kind of what is the best option that will maximize my overall satisfaction or be what's best for society if I'm a policymaker, whether it be in Congress or local politics or whatever. The last decision-making principle speaks to this decision of I finally decided between yes or no. So cost benefit analysis focuses on the kind of binary decision of, am I gonna do this or am I not gonna do this? Well, the reality is, is that um, that might not be enough. If you've decided to go through with a decision and engage in an activity, it might not be enough to just say, I'm gonna do this because you need to figure out what is the best option uh, excuse me, quantity to consume or produce or whatever your decision is related to, to figure out what is going to maximize whatever it is you're trying to maximize, satisfaction, wealth, etc. So marginal analysis is the key here because it's not just enough to say, hey, I'm starting a t-shirt business. Well, how many t-shirts are you going to make? Well, I don't know. Well, that's not good enough because that's not going to be adequate to get a loan from the bank to, to finance this or to be successful. So one of the most important concepts you're learning right now, this will be key throughout this entire course, is that marginal analysis results in optimal decisions. Marginal here means additional and really what it says is that we need to figure out what is the best level of activity to engage in. So it's not just enough for me to say I'm going to go exercise. I go to the gym. I stand on the treadmill. Don't turn it on. And then I leave. Is that really the best for my physical fitness or my health? Maybe it is. My brain said it was, but in reality it probably isn't. So I need to engage in marginal analysis, and I'm not saying that this needs to be quantitative. We'll have quantitative examples throughout the entire course, but in reality, what it means is that I am going to kind of play it with trial by error and go back and forth and figure out what is kind of the best amount, and then once I stabilize there, then that's kind of what my routine becomes. Regardless, the key to this course, and a lot of concepts in this course, not everything, but most concepts in this course, is to understand that the optimal decision is to continue any activity to the point where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. 
So marginal benefit is the additional benefit that you receive for consuming or producing one more unit of whatever it is that you're doing, whether it's running one more mile, eating one more slice of pizza, making one more unit of your good or service as a producer. That has to equal the additional cost associated with it. Because if that's the case, then any point or any amount that you consume or produce beyond that is going to take away kind of siphon off overall satisfaction or profits because that additional cost outweighs the additional benefit, so you shouldn't do it. And if you're stopping before this point, you're missing out on potential profits or additional satisfaction that you wouldn't otherwise have if you don't engage in that activity to that optimal point. Now, this isn't to say that we should consume everything into perpetuity. Again, we have scarcity which limits time, space, money, and that can really affect our overall satisfaction to a or productivity of a good or service or or an activity. And so the reality is is that we experience what's known as diminishing marginal returns. There's something that's known as the law of diminishing marginal returns. And the law of diminishing marginal returns is this situation that says that the more you consume of a good or service or the more resources that you allocate towards producing something, the less additional satisfaction or output you'll receive. So when we're learning about increasing opportunity costs or lower marginal product later on in the course, we're going to talk about diminishing marginal returns and the concept of, well, we only have so much space in our factory or our business or our office space. So if we keep employing more and more people, we're not really going to get additional productivity because we're going to keep running, running over each other and getting each other's way. Additionally, if you are a cookie monster or you're eating an entire pizza, maybe you're getting full, and so the more you consume of that good or service, it's going to affect your health negatively or you're going to get a stomach ache. And so it's not just enough to just consume something or produce something into perpetuity because there's going to be negative returns eventually as a result of the scarce time, space, money, etc. So again, a couple of specific examples. Let's say that John is a runner. What's the optimal amount of distance that John should run? So some of them like to do obstacle course races like Spartan or Tough Mudder. Others like to run marathons like uh, the Boston Marathon or the Cleveland Marathon or just marathons all over the nation. But they're a runner, they run consistently, but they don't really know what the best race for them is. The one that gives them the most enjoyment, the one that gives them the most health benefit, the one that they can reasonably train for without hurting themselves too much or affecting their diet or affecting their life. And so this is a marginal analysis that John has to undertake. Now, he could use a like a fitness tracker or track all his data or wear a Fitbit or an Apple Watch and kind of crunch all this data to kind of come up with a quantitative answer to this question. But in reality, what he's going to do is he's going to run a certain distance, then he'll run a longer distance, then he'll run a longer distance. And through that trial and error, he'll figure out what is the quantity of miles that he wants to run a day or what he wants to run in a certain amount of time that gives him the most satisfaction. So I have friends throughout my life that run 12 miles a day, some run six miles a day, others don't run at all. So it's just an individual decision that comes through marginal analysis. And you might not even think that you're doing it, but you are constantly. But if you're identifying that you're doing it, it makes it easier to kind of hone in on that skill and figure out what is the best decision for me to undertake. Second example is Denver or any city for that matter doesn't matter where we are in the world. Every city has a budget. Denver has an annual budget. They have decided that they're going to make a concerted effort to crack down on crime. What kind of crime? I don't know. Let's just say property crime. They're trying to crack down on property crime. So the question is how much of its budget should it allocate to police or how many officers should they have to best realize this goal? 
I don't know the answer, but this is an economic question that uses marginal analysis to kind of figure out what that answer is. Because they could set, they could spend all of their tax dollars on police and infor law enforcement, but the reality is, is then that means that there's no firefighters, there's no teachers, there's no whatever. So there's this cost benefit analysis, there's this trade off that comes with deciding what is the best opportunity, what is the best quantity, and that goes with marginal analysis. Now, economics, as we will learn in this course, one of the most important concepts related to economics is this concept of efficiency. Now, efficiency isn't the ultimate goal of all economists. We're not heartless. We're not dismal scientists as Thomas Carlyle would suggest back in the 1800s. Maybe it was even, it might have actually been the late 1700s, but reg regardless. The reality is, is that one of the best ways to kind of analyze and assess an optimal outcome for everybody is to be what's known as efficient. Because we have scarce resources, we don't, we aren't able to fulfill all the wants, so to try and be as efficient as possible with those resources can help get us closer to that end goal. So there are two types of efficiency. The first type of efficiency is allocative efficiency. An allocative efficiency is the state of the economy in which production is in accordance with its consumer preferences. That's a mouthful and that's kind of confusing if you don't really understand what it means. So really, I like to call it the Goldilocks principle. There might be some sort of physics thing related to that, but it's my own personal creation. So I call it the Goldilocks principle. It's an equilibrium principle. Allocative efficiency is basically the situation where every person that wants a specific unit of a good or service and is willing to pay a specific price for a good or service or needs it based on whatever the context is, the initial context was supply and demand, but it could be in a different context. But there's an allocation where every person that who is willing to meet the demands to get that product gets it. The other side of that allocative efficiency is that the individual firm country that's producing that good or service produces a, the exact amount that is demanded or needed by consumers. So I call it the Goldilocks principle because of the fact that if the firm produces too much, we're wasting important scarce resources that we could have used for something else that are now going to be wasted. So that's too much production. If we have a shortage, then we have too little production and every person who is willing to pay the price that it's sold for doesn't necessarily get it. Well, then that's inefficient. That's too little production, too much production. We want just right production. We want that just right porridge that Goldilocks principle level of efficiency. That's not the only type of efficiency that we can talk about in economics as we'll talk about them both and kind of the consequences of having them or not having them consistently through this course. Productive efficiency is producing goods and services at their lowest possible cost. So this might make you question economics for a second be like, well, Producing it for as cheap as possible. There are so many products that I buy at the dollar store that don't work as they're intended because they're produced too cheap. Well, the reality is, is as we learn about supply and demand later on in the course, productive efficiency is not speaking to just producing cheap junk. It's really just saying that the products, goods, and services that are demanded by consumers and the level of quality that is associated with those are produced at the lowest possible cost. Because if they're produced at the lowest possible cost, that leaves room for that firm to produce more. It lowers the price for consumers so they can save more money, and that creates more what's known as economic surplus. The reason why just producing at the lowest possible cost isn't a cause for concern is because of the fact that the reality is that the market will shift if a product is not up to the demands and the standards of the consumer. If it's garbage, if it's junk, 
just because it's there and just because it's cheaper doesn't mean that individuals will ultimately buy it. Uh, the word will get out and consumers will substitute that cheaper, less quality product with a better quality product. And that is kind of where the market will stabilize to. So just producing something for the sake of producing it for cheap, it's got to work and it's got to be efficiently produced uh, and, and have this requisite level of quality or else the market will just not consume it and then it will just cease to exist. At least we hope so. Now, the reason why economics is sometimes called the dismal science or people think that economists are heartless is because we harp on efficiency all the time. Because in reality, there's going to be tough choices that come with being efficient because it's impossible to meet all the demands. That's just a fact of life. And the fact of the scarce resources that we have on Earth or whatever is within our grasp as civilization. But that doesn't mean that economists are only focused on efficiency. They also focus on equity. And as we learn later on in the course, we'll talk about kind of equitable distribution versus efficiency. When you talk about equitable distribution, you're going to lose efficiency in the process. But in some cases, in a lot of cases, we feel like that the equitable distribution of uh, and fair distribution of economic benefits is important for our society to function and to be appropriately uh, existing. And so economists, as we'll learn consistently in this course, not only focus on efficiency, but also focus on equity. They're not the same and they're definitely not going to be the same. Um, in the sake of capitalism or being efficient, we can lose, uh, create inequities in our society. Um, income inequality is one of them. Um, if we have time, we'll talk about that in this course, but if not, um, it's something that we discuss in a uh, economic issues course or a macroeconomics course or a upper level macroeconomics course. So don't worry, just because uh, we talk a lot about efficiency doesn't mean that we're heartless and we don't care about equity and fairness because in reality we do it's just figuring out what do we lose in the process of being equitable and in a lot of cases the cost benefit analysis is that that loss of efficiency is worth having uh new incentives and equitable incentives created to help benefit society now there are two approaches to economics so what this really means is kind of how are we solving problems or what are we using economics for? That's what this is really talking about in terms of approaches to economics. So personally for me, normative economics is kind of an add on to positive economics. If done in the correct way in terms of academia, in terms of the scientific method, positive economics is, is a, subset of normative economics you need the positive economics to complete the normative economics but just to understand what they are positive economics in short is just what it is or how it works that's what we're trying to figure out it's an approach to economics to understand behavior the operation of systems why something is happening without making a judgment call about it so in my undergraduate and actually in all three of those papers that I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture that I wrote I started with positive economics I might have had a motivation for why I was writing those papers there might have been a reason that gave me the spark of the interest that might have had a bias or a subjective slant to it but in reality uh, because I Use, I use that to find interesting results and find interesting data and have interesting projects. But in reality, like I didn't use any of that to really figure out or taint or slant what I was trying to figure out because I didn't know the answer. I thought I knew the answer. I thought I might have known the answer and I had a policy motivation related to it potentially. But in reality, I really didn't know. I had a hypothesis. I tested the hypothesis. Two of the three times I was wrong. 
but I didn't change my data and change my model and adjust everything because of the fact that I was wrong because that's how we learn. And really positive economics is just, I have an interesting question I want to answer. Let's just say I'm just sitting here and I randomly decide I want to figure out what is the typical shelf life of an egg if it's refrigerated versus not refrigerated versus whatever. And I don't know, so I go through and I figure out what the answer is. I don't have an agenda related to it, but if I did, I was just saying, oh, well, let's not refrigerate eggs for whatever reason. Uh, that's not something that's going to infiltrate my positive economics analysis. Normative economics builds off of this because once you know the answer to something, once you figure out what type of behavior exists and kind of what the problem is or what the answer is to what you're trying to figure out from positive economics, you can take that and assess that behavior as a good thing or a bad thing and then come up with a potential solution for that um, problem if you see it as one or if you see it as a good problem how do we incentivize more people to do this that's known as what it ought to be type of analysis or normative economics the problem these days that happens a lot is that we we have people in this in the field that reverse engineer that they basically start with an agenda, have an agenda, know what they want to pound their, their fist on the table and talk about, and then they reverse engineer data or a model that's slanted and biased to try and justify why that should happen. My wildfire paper was motivated because I thought, oh, maybe there's some sort of behavior that we can undertake to try and uh, prevent wildfires to help these gateway communities from losing a bunch of money in the case of wildfires. And it turned out that even in the worst wildfires in Yellowstone and Tetons recorded history, I believe it was 1988 or eight, it was 1987 or 1988, the loss in economic value from lost tourism, lost revenues in the gateway communities of those two national parks and within it was still within the standard deviation or the reasonable assumptions of variability in uh, the revenues year over year. And so I, it turned out that really the wildfires didn't have that much of an effect on overall economic uh, activity and revenue for those gateway communities. And so the question then became, why not? Why doesn't it have an impact? And then I had to come up with new explanations for why. So there really what ended up being no normative economics related to it because I figured out that through the positive economics that there was really no reason to suggest some sort of policy change. So in reality, um, part of this also, my motivation, the reason why I'm kind of harping on this is in terms of uh, when I was an undergrad, I also majored in English and I learned about, I took three journalism classes and what I learned from taking journalism classes was that you're not supposed to be part of the story. You're supposed to kind of be the vessel in which the story presents itself. You collect information, you collect sources, and you share the story and you report it as it comes to you. You don't insert yourself in the story. If there's something that you don't agree with, it is what it is, but that's not the medium to express that. So the reality is, is that in terms of economics, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand what problems there are, what are the consequences associated with those problems, and then if it turns out that like you're commissioned by a firm or you're commissioned by the government to come up with a policy consideration as a result of your analysis of positive economics, then that's fine. But really, those are the two main kind of different ways of looking at economics. It's a policy decision 
in terms of normative, what we think should happen because it's good or bad versus positive, where it's just focusing on answering questions and understanding how something works. That TV show, How It's Made, I don't know if it's still on, but I, I was enamored by that show when I was like a teenager, just watching how hot dogs are made or Skittles are made. It's Sometimes it's gross. Sometimes it's interesting. Well, it's always interesting, but sometimes it's gross. Sometimes it's cool, but it's always fascinating. And really, that's one of the reasons why I am. I am passionate about teaching this course, and I've studied economics for a long time because of just being able to have a tool set and a skill set to be able to answer questions is just fascinating to me. So one of our last major topics here is economic models. So most economics is done through a model system. We don't just throw a bunch of information in and see what happens because usually that the world is too complicated to do that. One, we don't have enough data to answer everything. And two, the world is so complicated and has so many confounding factors and, and omitted variables and different things that really we want to analyze on a specific relationship. So we simplify the universe to help us simulate the real world and analyze or solve those problems that we're considering. Uh, so you might see it as a formal simplified statement of theory as a definition, but I like to call it kind of a simplified universe to help uh, simulate the real world. So we take the scary, confusing, multivariable world and we boil it down to a few specific things that we think are related to the thing that we're interested in covering. And then we create a model from it. And if it fits all of our specifications, then we try to uh, replicate it. And then if it's replicable, then we can use that model for predicting things in the future. And if it's not replicable or it doesn't fit, then we have to respecify the model and fix it until it works. And if it doesn't work, well, then at least we know what not to do in the future. And then the the mystery and the journey continues onward with a different economist. In our course, they're not going to be super complicated. They're going to be harder than a lot of things that you might have seen in traditional general education courses. There's going to be math associated with them, but I am confident that you are capable of handling that math and the whole reason for them existing is to help simplify the universe so you understand the relationships. Because if you just guess willy-nilly based on all the crazy things going on in the world, you might be right, but you'll often be wrong. Even us economists are wrong. So these models are here for your benefit to help kind of explain to the world what's going on. In this course, we will do math, but most of your models per se will take the form of graphs. So supply and demand will be a graph. Cost analysis could be a graph. A lot of different things can be graphs. Um, and you'll see them as graphs. And you might have to do some calculations, but you'll also be able to explain things in the context of graphs to help you better understand it. Because economists don't really use, they use graphs, but they don't use the traditional supply and demand graph as you would expect if you spent 15, 16 weeks in this course learning the same model over and over and over again. But one of the most important concepts related to economics in terms of economic models particularly is this concept of ceteris paribus. Uh, I went to law school and I was told that if you hear a lawyer speaking Latin, they don't know what they're talking about. I am not a lawyer. I am a law school graduate, but I'm not a lawyer, so I think I'm okay. Uh, you can trust my judgment here. And I think this might be the only Latin you learn in this course, but don't quote me on that. Ceteris paribus is basically a Latin for all else equal, um, but it's also a short form for everything else held constant. When we want to understand the relationship between one variable and another variable, so we want to understand the difference of the relationship between price and quantity demanded in our supply and demand model, we want to freeze everything else that could possibly affect demand. Because if we don't, then 
those other variables could be affecting our analysis and we won't get a clear and concise or accurate answer. So basically, if you've ever seen the movie Click with Adam Sandler, that's how we treat variables in the world when we're analyzing our economic models. We push the pause button, everything stays the same, we freeze it, and then we only look at the two variables or we only look at two variables at a time, how price and quantity demanded are related. Income can affect demand, prices of other goods can affect demand. Those could change and we will change them in the course, but when we're looking at the specific relationship between price and quantity demanded, we're holding everything else constant. We're pausing the rest of the world. You're, you could get a raise, you could like things differently, prices of other things that you might like that you could substitute it for can change, but we don't care about those. We're pausing that. We're assuming that everything that existed at this moment in time remains the same while we make that analysis. That's ceteris paribus. So that way we can look and see truly how those things are related. Again, not only are we trying to look at the relationship between just two variables, now economic models could have hundreds of variables, but we, through mathematical calculations, we actually look at things one at a time, but we let a computer do that these days because the calculations would take an infinite period of time if we did it by hand or be practically impossible. But piggybacking off of that analysis, what we're truly looking for is what's known as a causal relationship. We're trying to see whether X is causing Y to happen, Y is causing X to happen, or neither of them is causing the other to happen. The reason being is because of the fact that there could be a relationship between two variables, but that's just mere correlation. Correlation just means that something is related, but the relationship is unknown, and it could potentially be insignificant because it's caused by something else that we aren't accounting in the model or we're not thinking about. Causation specifically means that one specific variable is causing that other thing to happen. An example of this is, uh, so the most important thing you can learn from this is a correlation does not imply causation. Correlation does not imply causation. Correlation is just a relationship between two variables. Causation is distinctly saying that one variable causes another to change because of its existence. A student of mine gave an example a few years ago about this correlation does not imply causation. They went to a, uh, they went boating out on a lake in the Great Lakes and they took their dog with them. And when their dog got on the boat, it started throwing up. So their assumption was that the dog is seasick because the dog being on the boat is causing the dog to throw up. But it was just a correlation. Really what was causing the dog to throw up was apparently while the dog was on the dock, the dog ate and swallowed a towel and was choking on it and was trying to get it out of its system. They took the dog to the vet. The, dog, or the vet got the towel out of the dog. And ever since, the dog has been not seasick when it goes on the boat. So correlation does not imply causation. Another example of this was in the 1970s. A study came out that said that there was a direct link between coffee and cancer. So if you consumed coffee, you had a higher risk of cancer. And a lot of people freaked out about this. They were suggesting that they should stop drinking coffee. It's a death trap. You're going to get cancer. But people still drink coffee. There's a coffee shop on campus. There's Starbucks everywhere. There's coffee shops everywhere. People consume it consistently every single day all over the world. So is this true? Does coffee really cause cancer? And the answer is no. I mean, it might in some other way, but there's been a lot of research that says it doesn't. And the reason why this study turned out to imply that coffee caused cancer was because of the fact that there was such a high correlation between coffee and smoking 
that the noise from the smokers and the cigarette consumers was basically proxied through the coffee variable. And so it was actually the smoking that was causing the cancer, not the coffee. So that's why you have to be careful when you're doing these, these research projects. So our penultimate or second to last topic here is this question about allocation. So there are three basic questions that must be answered in an economy. Uh, you can apply it to your own life if you want to, honestly. So the first one is what gets produced? So we need to figure out in our economy, in our society, what's gonna get made. The second question is how is it going to be produced? How are these resources going to be allocated? So with our resources, how are we allocating to get production? How are we gonna produce it? And then third is who gets what is produced? Based on where you live, this can vary based on kind of the three types of economy setups that we have in the world as it exists today. You can apply this to your own life because in terms of the three basic questions that need to be answered, what gets produced when uh, your entire life, the question is, what are you going to be when you grow up? What is your career path? What are you majoring here at the college? What are your what are your plans? And then the question then is, how are you going to get there? What are you doing? If the goal is to get a degree or to be an economist or be a lawyer or a doctor or a nurse or whatever, how are you going to get there is the important production steps to be able to achieve that goal that you've set out for yourself. So maybe this course is one of those, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Maybe it isn't. But ultimately, you have to figure out what is going to get you there. And then lastly, who gets what is produced? Who are the beneficiaries of your existence, of your career, of your wealth, of your satisfaction, of your, of your enjoyment, whether it's a significant other, family, friends, pets, etc., co-workers, the company you work for, the, the government entity you work for. This can apply to your own life. And the reason why it does is because of the fact that the economy is the byproduct of the accumulation of every individual making their own decisions. So that has been a big change in macroeconomics. This isn't a macroeconomics course, but the way macroeconomics is taught at the graduate level is completely different because we identify the fact that individuals accumulated, businesses accumulated, all making their decisions for themselves in this messy world is really what the economy is. So that it should make sense that these three basic questions, if you answer them yourselves and you accumulate that out, is really what the economy is. So these economic organizational structures define kind of how resources are allocated in your country. Uh, the first one is a centrally planned economy. So a centrally planned economy is basically where the government decides almost all of the resource allocation and production. They control the resources that centralized. They decide how they're going to be allocated, how they're going to be produced, who produces them, and who gets them. The opposite of the spectrum is a market economy where we have this relationship between households who are the consumers and the providers of what are known as factors of production and the firms who are the producers of the goods and services and make money by selling goods and services. Those relationships between the interactions of those two parties determines how the resources are allocated through what's known as a market. Now, you might think of a market as a um, supermarket. You might think of it as Amazon. You might think of it as uh, a farmer's market. You might think of it as a number of different things. And the reality is they all are markets. The thing is, is that a market is kind of really just a place in which a transaction occurs. So it doesn't have to be necessarily physical. These days we're all buying stuff on Amazon and it's physical in terms of the server and the computer and stuff like that. But you're not physically talking to the person. You're not handing over money, but a transaction is occurring. 
So a market is really just where those buyers and sellers come together to trade. And so the market is where the resource allocation happens because firms figure out what households want, households figure out how much firms want to sell it for, and then through negotiations, that's where the market system comes from. The last one is known as the mixed economy. And the mixed economy is this same relationship as the market economy, but the difference is it's kind of somewhere in the middle of the spectrum where the government might control a specific industry in the country, or they might control a certain significant amount of resources and they intervene, but it's not to the level of where they're doing everything. Basically, the market system is allowed to exist, but they feel like through the public policy perspective or an equitability for uh, equitable perspective, they realize that that mixed economy or that government needs to intervene in that that industry. And so those are the three or economic organizational structures. But the last thing I want to talk about kind of speaks to this question of government isn't mentioned in market econ or excuse me in the market economy one. It's mentioned in mixed. It's mentioned in centrally planned, but it's not mentioned in the market economy. And the question is, is the government there? And the question to, or excuse me, the answer to that question is yes. And the reason why is because we need a legal structure and a legal framework in order for an economy system to work. Doesn't mean anarchy, doesn't mean the absence of government. It really just means that we need a government structure there to enforce laws and legal rights that allow for the market system to have faith for participation. The two major rights that associate with this are property rights and contract rights. The first one is property rights and that allows for defined boundaries of products of one person and another. If that doesn't exist, someone could plausibly just take whatever you have and pass it off as their own and there's no recourse for it. So property rights are actually known as negative rights, not positive rights. They're actually the right to exclude others from using what you possess. So if you buy a house, it's really excluding everybody else in the world from accessing it. Now, it's typically got a positive right with it because you're not sharing it with anybody else. But as I'll talk about later on in the course when we talk about patents, there can be this overlap between a property right that doesn't actually allow you to use it, but it does still allow for you to exclude everyone else from using it, which is why it's called the a negative right. The last one speaks to contract rights because what this does is it says that if someone promises to do something or give you something in exchange for something that you've done for them, there's enforcement and recourse that can occur if they do not hold up their end of the bargain. Without these two rights, then it allows for a lot more chaos and less faith and willingness to participate in the market system. If you know that what is yours is yours and what is mine is mine, and if I promise to do something for you that's legal and I don't do it, there is legal recourse through the government systems to allow for you to be compensated for it. If not, then you might be not as willing to participate in the system and then the system is not as strong as it could be. So does a market economy have no government? The answer is no. Could it exist without a government? Possibly, but that existence of that government enforcing those rights makes it a lot more uh, likely to succeed. So that concludes the introductory information of this course. Uh, our next lecture will discuss our first model of the course, which is the production possibilities frontier. We'll also discuss another model known as the circular flow model, which will help kind of more easily demonstrate this market system that we just discussed. And then we'll also talk about kind of how resources are allocated and how uh, trade is a very important aspect 
of allowing for ourselves to be able to have more production and more efficient production than we otherwise would have if we were all just individual actors kind of just producing for ourselves. So I look forward to speaking with you in that lecture about those topics. Other than that, please feel free to contact me with any questions related to this lecture, and I wish you the best of luck on your assessments related to this concept. Thank you.